All right, Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30 this evening. The First Amendment to the Constitution says that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. I love how it says the freedom of speech. James Madison specifically wanted to include the word the, the freedom of speech, to emphasize that it is a natural right. That government is not the grantor of that right. All government can do is either acknowledge it or deny it. Government can't delete it and can't grant it. It's granted by God. That's why it's a natural right, the freedom of speech. The freedom of speech, it exists whether the government acknowledges it or not. And boy, what a, what a time to live in. Where freedom of the freedom of speech is mocked and it's scorned and it's attacked more than maybe ever in the history of our country. And why is that? Isaiah 30 uh, gives us some insight into that. It offers an accurate parallel to what we see in our day, and it really captures the natural man. How stubborn is the natural man? <laughs> the, the, this, the way that the natural man reacts to God is so telling and how the stubbornness of the natural man, the carnal man. And so we see that here. Uh, this passage talks about people who I will call, this is the title of the message, ear pluggers and mouth gaggers. That's our title tonight. Ear pluggers and mouth gaggers. They, they do a lot of this, so they have to hear speech, and then they want to gag, put gags in mouths so to, to shut other people up. And so, well, you're name-calling. That's petty. You're name-calling. No, I think I'm just describing them the way the text does. <laughs> I think the text, uh, I'm, all I'm doing is paraphrasing what our passage says. Isaiah 30, we read through verse 7 last week, so we'll read from verse 8 to verse 17 in Isaiah 30. Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book. Amen. Book I'm holy that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. This book is forever and ever. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. Earplugs, fingers in their ears. Verse 10, which say to the seers, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not. But put gags in their mouths. Prophesy not unto us right things. <laughs> Speak unto us Smooth things, prophesy deceits, libels. Verse 11, get you out of the way. This is what they say to the prophets. Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Get that stuff out of you. Verse 12, wherefore thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise this word. Because ye despise this word, and trust in oppression and perverseness, and stay thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it assured to take fire from the hearth or to take water withal out of the pit. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And ye would not. Sounds a lot like what Jesus said in Matthew 23. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I gather you unto myself as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. And ye, ye that stoneth the prophets, ye that killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto you, and ye would not. Jesus may have been quoting Isaiah 30 in verse 15 when he said that in Matthew 23. Uh, oops, I lost my page. Isaiah 30, that was verse 15, verse 16. But ye said, no, for we will flee upon horses. Therefore shall ye flee, uh, and we will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one, at the rebuke of five shall ye flee, till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain and as an ensign on a hill. Earpluggers and mouth gaggers. We just read about them. Number one this evening, they despise the truth. Earpluggers and mouth, gag mouth gaggers <laughs> despise 
the truth. We find that in verse 12, it says, because he despised this word, Isaiah's word, a word from God. What did Jesus say about God's word? John 17, 17, thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. And so if they despise this word, that means they despise truth. Hence our first point, they despise truth. Isaiah's message for Judah was from God, and God is truth. But Isaiah's hearers just dislike it. They dislike the truth because the truth hurts. The truth is often unflattering. The truth, uh, and, and accepting unflattering truth requires humility. The truth is often unflattering, and accepting unflattering truth requires humility. The absence of humility always leads to two things. The absence of humility, so in a sense pride, it always leads to the denial of truth and to the avoidance of truth. Avoidance as in, I don't want to hear it, stop talking, stop saying it. The absence of humility always leads to the denial of truth and the avoidance of truth. Where do we see that here? Speaking of truth, verse 9, they're lying children. <laughs> verse 10 says they want the prophets to prophesy deceits. They don't want to hear things that are right, it says in verse 10. But <laughs> prophesy not unto us right things. In other words, if your message is truthful, if your message is correct, if your message, your speech corresponds to reality, we don't want to do that. <laughs> if it's right, if it's accurate, if it's factual, if it corresponds to what's real, we do, we do not want to hear it. <laughs> Sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? Speaking of this matter of life, pro-life groups put up these graphic images that, vision, that show a visual of what abortion really is. And they're gross. They're gory. They're violent. You know why? Because they represent truth. They're real pictures of what really happens. It's truth. And, and so that, you know, Brother Seaman and his group puts those up in places. And, and why? Well, that, that's insensitive. What are you trying to do? Churn our stomachs? No, it's to show you what you're defending. This is, this is the truth of what you're defending. This is what it looks like. You sure you want to continue to push that? You sure you want to continue to promote that? But they say, here's what they say. We don't want to see that. Of course you don't. <laughs> you don't want to see the truth. They say, here's what they say. Get that out of here. We don't want the biological facts. <laughs> they despise truth. They say, just, you know, just tell us, tell us what we want to hear. Prophesy the seeds. Tell us that sodomy is a healthy, normal, appropriate, alternative lifestyle. Don't tell us that it's self-destructive. Don't tell us that 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 a, you'll, they'll get AIDS and they'll die of premature death. We don't want to hear that. Just prophesy the seats. That might be the biological truth, but we don't want to hear that. You shouldn't be allowed to say that. They despise the truth. Just tell us that a man who feels that he is a woman really is a woman. <laughs> tell us that his feelings magically, there's that word again, his feelings magically change his biological reality. Just tell us that. That's what we want to hear. Just prophesy deceits unto us. The truth, the biological facts, we don't want anything to do with this. We don't want to hear it. Tell us that there's nothing wrong with promiscuity and cohabitation. Just tell us God doesn't mind. Just tell us it's okay. As long as there's love in there somewhere, tell us that's okay. We got mega churches all over the country. Don't ask a single question about it. No problem. You want to be a member? No problem. You're living with somebody you're not married to? promiscuous, fornication, go ahead, it's fine. Just, just tell us it's not a big deal. That's what we want to hear. That way we don't have to repent and humble ourselves. Tell us smooth things. That's what it says here in verse 12. That's what they want to do. Or pardon me, in verse 10. Speak unto us smooth things. <laughs> if you despise the word, they despise the word. They want smooth things instead, so they say, tell us smooth things. And look at the alternative in verse, in verse 12. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness. If you despise the word, guess what you're left with? Perverseness. You despise this word and you refuse to hear it, you plug your ears, 
and you want to silence those who, who declare it, you're left with perverseness. That's what you get. That's what verse 12 says. And the farther man gets from the word of God, the more perverse man gets. And the more perverse man gets, the more perverse society and the community get. And here we are. <laughs> here we are. We have all the, the issues that I just listed. <laughs> that's, that's where we are. Does perverseness not characterize some of those examples that I just gave? Smooth things. That's what they want. They don't want, there's two kinds of messages they don't want. They don't want, and this is Isaiah's audience, Judah, and our day today. They don't want a supernatural message because that takes faith. They want to be able to see it. Remember, Isaiah's audience wants salvation from the Assyrian threat, but they want, they want to do it themselves. They want to go to Egypt. They want something they can see. They don't, they don't want to believe by faith that God can. They want to see a supporting a lot allied army there to help them. They want to walk by sight and not by faith. So they, they can't have a supernatural message, and they can't have a moral message. Because, again, that requires humility. A moral message places some moral boundaries on them that they would then have to obey. So they want no part of faith, and they want no part of obedience. They don't want a supernatural message that takes faith. They don't want a moral message that takes obedience. They want no part of either one of them. And so what do they do? Plug their ears. We found that, we've seen that elsewhere in Scripture. 1 Kings 22, uh, Ahab is the king, and Ahab is wanting to go up to Ramoth Gilead to war, and he wants the prophet's blessing, and he's got 400 prophets who are all a bunch of yes men. They don't hear from God. They don't declare God's word. They tell people whatever they want to hear, just like most of the preachers on TV and most of the people filling up arenas. They just tell people what they want to hear, smooth things. And, and so, but, but Ahab says, isn't there one more prophet? Isn't there another one somewhere? And Ahab says, yes, but I hate him. <laughs> He's talking about Micaiah. Micaiah the prophet, why do you hate Micaiah? Because he actually says what God says. Even if it's not what people want to hear. And so Micaiah, uh, you know, all the, the yes men say, yes, sir, it will prosper, go up. Micaiah says, yeah, go ahead up, but you're going to die. <laughs> yeah. And so for, because Micaiah was willing to deliver God's truth, he was hated, he was beaten, he was jailed. They, they tried to put a gag in his mouth. Don't you say that. Put him in a jail so no one has to hear him. Silence him. An attack on freedom of speech. Jail somebody who's giving the, uh, an unapproved message. Government wants to control. King Ahab, the government, wants to control speech. That's diametrically opposed to our nation's founding. Founded on God's word, freedom of speech. And so throw him in jail. And of course, Micaiah was the only one who was right. And when Ahab is killed in battle, of the 401 who prophesied, one was right. And it was Micaiah. You know what Ahab had working for him? A bunch of Joel Osteens. That's what he had. The 400 prophets of Ahab were a bunch of Joel Osteens. Joel Osteen is the guy who says, you know, I don't really like to preach on sin. Because that's kind of negative. And I just don't really want to be negative. I want to focus on the positive. And so I just focus on the positive. So I don't really preach on sin. Yeah, you're a yes man. You're just giving smooth things that people want to hear. Smooth things don't prick you. The word prick in Scripture, Acts chapter 2, Peter. Peter is preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the salvation that's secured by the resurrection of our Savior from the tomb, and he's preaching it to the ones who killed him. He's looking them in the eye, and, and he says, he's risen, he's not there, and you're the ones who killed him. And the Bible says they were pricked in their hearts. Some of them got saved, some of them didn't. But that, that was the Holy Spirit filling the word of God as it's confrontationally delivered, and it pricked them in their hearts. Does a smooth thing prick? Nope. Smooth things don't prick. The Bible is a sword. It pierces. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints of the marrow. The word of God, it pricks and it pierces. They want smooth things. Smooth things don't prick and don't pierce. Only smooth. And so the natural man is told that his sin offends the holiness of God, verse 12. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel. Boy, you... You want a message that really offends the snowflakes. You want a message that really bothers those who are pricked in the heart by it. Preach on the holiness of God. You, you don't see the ones that fill up arenas preaching, be ye holy, for I am holy. They don't preach it. 
Because that they're, they're, when, when the natural man receives that message from the word of God, he can either humble himself and receive it, or he can say, that's insensitive. That's offensive. I'm offended by that. I gave a guy a track today. This is, I can't remember this ever happening. At the gas station, I gave him a gospel track. He read it. <laughs> well, went to his truck and read it. Walked it back in very polite and said, thank you. I'm not interested. I don't believe that I'm a sinner. And walked away. <laughs> well, as he walked away, I said, Jesus loves you and he'll save you if you turn from your sin. If you turn to him from your sin, he'll save you. And he, he didn't respond. Super polite guy. But, but those are your options. Humble yourself and admit it or say that's offensive. And, and you know, he, he didn't cr- crumple it up and throw it on the floor, but that's what college campuses do. That's what I'm offended. You better not say that. That's offensive. Yeah, if you humble yourself, you disagree with God. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Nothing shall offend them. You might remember in John 6, Jesus taught that he is the bread of life. He is the bread from heaven. His disciples, this is what his disciples said. This is a hard say. This is a hard say. Jesus sensed that they were murmuring against him in their hearts. They said, this is a hard say. Who can hear it? And Jesus said, what? Don't this offend you? <laughs> what? Does this offend you? Or are you going to claim Psalm 119, verse 165, the great peace of they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Guess what? Isaiah says elsewhere that the gospel and the Savior is a rock of offense. It's a rock of offense. Paul asked the Galatians, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? If they despise the truth, then you become their enemy. Paul told Timothy that in the last days, those who, who hear sound doctrine shall not endure sound doctrine, but shall be turned unto fables and shall turn away from the truth. Why? Because their ears itch. Their ears are itching for smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Just tell us what we want to hear. We don't want sound doctrine. We want to go to fables instead. But I love verse 8. <laughs> now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. You can despise God's book. You can despise God's word, like verse 12 says, but it ain't going in. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 40 says, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the words of our God shall stand forever. You can hate it all you want. It's never going anywhere. You might as well just agree with it. But there's tremendous irony here, too, in that they plug their ears because they don't like the sharp things. They don't like the piercing things. And they say, no, we only want smooth. And what they're not realizing is that God's word has smooth things, too. They just throw the baby out with the bathwater. We don't like the pricking and the piercing and the offending, and we don't want the humility. We just want the permissive. We just want the soft. We just want the smooth. Well, God's word might not be permissive, but it has some smooth things. It's filled with love. It's filled with graciousness. It's filled with compassion. It's filled with comfort. It's filled with consolation. God isn't all fire and brimstone. He's not all truth. Like we said Sunday morning, truth and mercy are met together. He's got grace and mercy, too. But because they, they couldn't stand the, the more uh, piercing things, they threw it all out. And so, so they end up looking for smooth things somewhere else. When you could have had them, if you would have accepted the truth as well. Earpluggers and mouth gaggers, number one, despise the truth. Number two, despise freedom. Despise freedom. Their hatred for God's message itself becomes a hatred for the very freedom to relay and express and declare God's message. Because they hate the content, they hate the opportunity. Because I hate what you said so much, I don't think you should be allowed to say it. They say, you know, this earplugging thing, it's nice that I don't have to hear what you're saying. That way I can just be in my own little world. But it's kind of inconvenient having both of my fingers used up. What if I want a cup of coffee? And so you know what would be a little bit more convenient? (laughs) If I could just put a gag in their mouths. Then I could have use of my hands, and they wouldn't have to hear what they're saying. And so that's what they try to do to Isaiah. Look at verse 10. They say to the seers, see not, the prophets prophesy not. Okay, pardon me, verse 11. Get you out of the way. Just get out of here. 
The one that you're preaching, just, just cease from the voice. We don't want to hear that. Get out of the way. Get out of here. Go away. We don't want to have to hear that. Be silenced. You shouldn't be allowed to say that here, especially if it's the message that God is holy. Cause that to cease. We find that elsewhere in Scripture. Same thing that was said to Amos. Amos is this country boy preacher that's got a message for King Jeroboam II. His message is, you're evil, you're wicked. God's going to destroy this nation. The Assyrians are going to come, take you into captivity. And he's told, "Get flee, go away. Uh, this is what it says in Amos chapter 7. Go, flee thee away, prophesy not again anymore. In other words, take this gag and put it in your mouth. Just, you're, those are unapproved sayings. That's unapproved speech. The, 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 we don't approve of the things you're saying, so you can't say them. Jeremiah was told the same thing. Jeremiah's message was, we have been evil. God is chasing us. Chasing us. He's raising up the Babylonians to, to take Judah captive. You need to just submit to the Babylonians. Submit to them and say, this is God's judgment. We do deserve it. And just, just go to Babylon. And by the way, you'll be out in 70 years. But that's how long it's going to be. It was, that was an unapproved message. And so Jeremiah is jailed and beaten. And, and just like Micaiah, Jeremiah is thrown down in the bottom of a well. And read the misadventures of Jeremiah. Uh, they're chronicled well. The same thing with the apostles. The apostles preach the resurrection. They preach salvation in, in this man. To him giveth all the prophets witness that whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. He's the Savior, the one that's risen from the grave. But you have to repent and turn to him. And, and what happens to the apostles throughout most of the book of Acts? Jail. Uh, Stephen stoned. Uh, Paul is stoned. In prison. Why? Shut him up. No freedom of speech. You, you, if you say those things, we need to sequester you from the population and hide you down in jail where nobody can hear you say those things. We need to silent. Put a gag in their mouth so we don't have to hear this. Why? Because people don't want to think. People do not want to, the natural man does not want to grapple with ideas that he disagrees with. They don't want their views to be challenged. So what do they do now? They claim that they've been triggered. I've been triggered, and I don't feel safe. Uh, my feelings are hurt, so I need, a safe, I need a safe space from your ideas and beliefs. They're now, I saw this on the high school that has the rock that they put different messages on, words are violence. Not according to the definition of the word violence. <laughs> Everything is redefined. Well, words are violence because words are violent toward my feelings. And so I need a safe space to be protected from ideas and beliefs that I find distasteful, that I find offensive. It is intellectual laziness is what it is. It's pure and simple intellectual laziness. It is insecurity and lack of confidence in their ability to articulate better ideas. They're no confidence in their ability to persuade them that their ideas are any better. Just like the Catholic Church through the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages, they knew their teachings were against the Bible. They didn't want anyone exposing them. They didn't want anyone confronting them and saying, hey, this doctrine in the Catechism is not in agreement with what this book says. Well, then just find all the Bibles and burn them. And if anybody touches one, cut his hand off or light them on fire. Silence the message. That way we don't have to actually answer questions. That way we don't have to articulate a reasoned defense of this book. That way we don't have to explain why Catholicism is better. We know we can't explain it, so we'll just forcibly silence dissent. Same thing with Islam. Exact same thing with Islam. We can't really persuade anyone, any thinking person, that Islam is true especially anyone from, from Christianity, because Christianity had been around 700 years by the time Islam came on the scene. We can't really explain why there's another book that's needful, a Quran. And so rather than having to explain it and persuade and defend, we'll just kill you if you say anything against it. Here we are, 1,300 years later. We've been doing it ever since. Can't give a defense. <laughs> Intellectual laziness. Communism. Militant communism in, in Russia and in China. We've decided to adopt Charles Darwin, and Godless Evolution. And then Karl Marx comes along 15 years later or so, influenced so much by Darwin that he takes Darwinism and spins it on and, and gives a, a, a governmental application of Darwinism. So you have Marx and Darwin, and so communist Russia, communist China say, this is what we have. We've installed Darwin, Darwinism and Marxism. We can't actually reason or persuade 
our defense of them. So you just better not question. And if you question, you go to the concentration camp in Siberia or we kill you. Because we can't really explain the superiority of it. It's intellectual laziness. They know they can't defend it with logic or reason or history or facts, so they do it by force. <laughs> Rather than rebutting beliefs and ideas they find distasteful with better beliefs and ideas, it's easier to just silence them. Judah was doing the same thing to Isaiah, just like the evildoers today. They're, what are they doing today? Seeking to allow only approved speech. Congress is filled with people that think only approved speech should be allowed. Uh, there are certain states where you have to use people's preferred pronouns or, or you get a, a citation. If a man says he's a woman and, and you, you say, hey, dude, hey, buddy, hey, pal, hey, mister, you've committed a crime. Your speech is not approved. And for now, it's just a citation. How long before it's incarceration? You can't, in the military, you can't preach Romans 1. You're not allowed. Uh, the military has a rule that chaplains cannot preach Romans 1. Speech is, is illegal. College campuses, uh, speakers that present ideas that are not in agreement with the prevailing humanism that has so polluted college campuses, the speakers get run out of campus, run No free speech. You can't say those things here. They're not approved. And, and so they're not allowed to say them. And, and, and I wonder, there's some great Bible verses that, that say I were to put it on a T-shirt or say I were to put it on a bumper sticker on my car or a sign in my yard. I don't know, John 14, where Jesus says, uh, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Or maybe Acts 4.12, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved but Jesus. Or you can get even more harsh with it and go to Matthew 23 where Jesus says to the Pharisees, how shall ye escape the damnation of hell? I could put those on a t-shirt and put them on a yard sign and put them on a bumper sticker. How long before I am arrested, charged, tried, convicted, and sentenced for doing it? Because it's unapproved. How long? How long is it an offense, a criminal offense to pass out a gospel tract? And so well, what do they call those laws? Those are hate speech laws. That's hate speech. And the reality is that the, the supporters of those laws are the ones who hate speech. <laughs> and the freedom thereof. They're the ones that hate speech. And how convenient to prolong a virus. Let's milk this virus thing for all it's worth. Let's extend this thing. Let's, let's exaggerate it and embellish it. Let's lie about all the numbers. Let's, let's let the, the most liberal, godless news sources really push this thing. That'll help keep churches apart. That'll keep those Christian people who oppose leftist ideology, that, that'll keep those Christian people from getting together and, and being encouraged in those right-wing beliefs. Just, just make them meet on Zoom for as long as possible so they can't really exhort one another under good works. Maybe under an arrangement like this, they won't take that gospel stuff out into the community because, you know, you're not allowed to, you have to limit all assemblies. And, and so it's, it's very convenient. So you, you restrict liberty. What are you left with? Oppression. Look at verse 12. What happens when you hate the word? Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because he despised this word and trust in oppression. You don't want words and ideas you hate. You make them, you criminalize them. You're left with oppression. What is the opposite of freedom? It's oppression. And that's what you're left with. Number one, uh, earpluggers and mouth gaggers despise truth. Number two, despise freedom. I don't know if I said that one or not. They despise freedom. Lastly, number three, they despise Bible salvation. They despise Bible salvation. Verse 15, Isaiah tells them how they can have salvation from the threat of the Assyrian army. He says, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength, and ye would not. Isaiah's talking about the Assyrian army. He says, hey, here's how you can get salvation from the Assyrian army. The first thing is to know that you can't. You can't earn it. You can't achieve it. You can't strategize it. You can't secure it. You need God to do it all for you. That's the only way you'll get salvation from the Assyrian army. You can't admit you can't do it yourself. And so he says in verse 15, return. Return there has to do with repentance. Isaiah uses the word return 
as a synonym for repent in chapter 10, chapter 19, chapter 21. He's saying, come back to God. Come back to the, the one who, who started you as a nation. Come back to him. Let God handle it. That means rest for you. That's how you rest, quietness, peace. Uh, I love the word quietness there in this passage because that's the same thing Isaiah said King Ahaz back some years earlier in chapter 7 when Ahaz is wondering what to do about the Syria-Ephraim alliance that's come up against him, not the Assyrians, but the Syrians. Isaiah's message to him was take heed and be quiet. Be quiet. You can't do it. You need God. You need God to do it completely. So take heed and be quiet. Now, while this is about national security 2,700 years ago, what, a, what an accurate parallel to Bible salvation. You can't do it. You can't earn it. You can't achieve it. You can't secure it. You can't accomplish it. You need God to do it completely. It is all of him and not of you. And, and when you receive it, you can have quietness and peace and rest like this passage speaks of. We can't be saved by trying to earn it and work for it. Those who believe in a work salvation can never and will never achieve it. They never will. You can, salvation can only be received by acknowledging that it is 100% the cross and the resurrection in the gospel and not of me, not of good works. But Catholicism says salvation can be received only by taking the sacraments and being the person doing the works. Uh, Amish, Mennonites, they say that salvation can, re can be received by believing in Jesus Christ and being a good person. Got to have both. Good works. You have your part in it. It's, yeah, it's some of God, but some of you. You've got to do your part. Think of Arminian theology. Arminian theology encompasses Methodist, Pentecostal, Charismatic, uh, Church of God, Assembly of God. They would say that salvation can be received by, by, by receiving the gospel, but you've got to have your good works to keep yourself safe. You've got, you've got to earn it, the, the keeping of it. Because if, you're, if you don't do enough good works, then you'll lose it. So you're, you've got to have your part in it. You've got to achieve. You've got to secure. You've got to keep. Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, Seventh-day Adventist, all of them, you've got to earn your salvation. Seventh-day, you better, you better worship on the Sabbath or you're not saved. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, hey, you've got to do your part or you can't be it. You can't have it. Buddhism, Hinduism, well, you have to earn their body. You want to be enlightened? You want to get to the state of nirvana? you got to earn it. you got to achieve it. Not Bible salvation. Bible salvation is for by grace are ye saved through faith. In that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of yourself. It's not of works. And when you repent and believe it and, and receive Christ and acknowledge that it was all him and not me, you can rest. You can rest not agonizing over whether or not you've been good enough, whether or not you've achieved it and earned it, you can have some quietness in your soul, knowing it's done already. It's done for you. You, you don't have that pressure on yourself that you could never live up to. Rest and quietness go together. It's put in this passage says confidence in quietness and in confidence. We, re we confidently rest in Jesus's crucifixion, in Jesus' burial, in Jesus' resurrection, in his giving of everlasting life that he's won as a free gift, and his keeping us safe. We confidently rest in him. Psalm 118, verse 8 and 9, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is the word that explains all this to us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I'm glad that when I go soul winning, I bring tracks because they're convenient. But if I'm going to actually get a chance to talk to somebody, I don't need a Catholic catechism. I don't need a Jeho all the Jehovah's Witness books. I don't need all the Seventh-day Adventist books. All I need is a Bible. I don't have to have Joseph Smith's explanation of it or the Watchtower's explanation of it. All the other groups, they need all their other materials. All, I can just grab my Bible and show them Bible salvation. That's all I need. But if you despise this word, Proverbs 13, 13 says this. You might want to jot that down next to Isaiah 30 and verse 12, where it says, because he despises his word. Proverbs 13, 13. Proverbs 13, 13 says, whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed. Shall be destroyed. Well, who's going to destroy them? Our gods, uh, Jesus said, fear not them which are able to kill the body only, 
but fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. God will destroy him. And that's what verses 13 and 14 talk about here. They talk when they say that you despise the word to be destroyed like a wall in a building that's being demolished, or like a smashed earthen vessel, potter's vessel. Be destroyed. Man who says, no, I can be good enough to earn it, is going to be just like verse 16. Verse 16 says, no. They say, no, we don't want God to deliver us from the Assyrians. We want to do it ourselves. We're going to go to the Egyptians. They've got horses, and their horses are fast, and we'll earn our salvation from the Assyrian army. And God says here, no, they're going to pursue you and overtake you. I don't care how fast those horses are. God says, I'll give your enemies faster horses. Verse 16, but ye said, no, for we will flee upon horses. Therefore shall ye flee. And you're going to say, we're going to ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. God says, I'll track you down, and I'll give your enemy more swiftness. Your very effort and attempt to save yourself will be your own doom. And that is true of everyone who believes in work salvation today. That's millions of them. Millions of them. Their, their attempt to save themselves is their very undoing. They're going to be destroyed because they can't save themselves. They're not strong enough. They need Jesus Christ to save them. The very replacement for God they choose will be their undoing. I am so glad we don't need earplugs. What? When this is preached, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I want my faith increased. I don't want to plug up my ears to the word. Neither do you. That's why you're here. I don't want to put a gag in a preacher's mouth. I want to hear. I want to have ears to hear. I want to let that, that preacher speak. Don't despise the word. Love the word. Amen. Psalm 119 says, For thy words are very pure, therefore thy servant loveth them. Thy words are very pure, therefore thy servant loveth them. I want to be, God's words are pure. I want to be his servant, and I want to love his word. I don't want to be destroyed. I like to remain good and undestroyed. That's a good part of my day to be undestroyed. Amen? He preserves us. He keeps us. Heavenly Father, this is a, a stark warning. Lord, and it's so relevant to our day. What you've laid out for us here is so 